This episode goes out to a Riley McDermott. Hi, Riley! This video is brought to you in part by the patrons of the Lazy Eyebrow and from the comments and watch time from viewers like you. Thank you! Why, hello, YouTube! Greetings from the Lazy Eyebrow to a dire review that sort of feels like it shares the same sort of theme with the last video. This is the review for Alternators Ricochet. For anybody that's completely in the dark about this nearly 20-year-old toy line, Alternators, and by extension Vinyl Tech, were a series of Transformer toys that released in the very early 2000s with a nearly one-sided bias on the vehicle mode, the consequence of which was usually an okay at best robot. And that description absolutely fits the character we're looking at today, Ricochet. Ricochet turns into an absolutely stunning 2004 Subaru WRX, and I mean stunning, like I could not stop taking photos of the vehicle mode. Like look at this car, it's just so well done. And yeah, that's kind of par for the course for alternators, but look at this car. Look at this car. Would you just look at this car? This is the very definition of a robot in disguise, and I don't just mean that in the fictitious sense, but like most alternators, it's almost impossible to tell that this can transform, as it really does look so much like just a 124 scale model of an Impreza. Like, check out all these details. Front and center, you have the Pleiades cluster logo on a semi-accurate cross-style grill, translucent plastic covering chromed inset headlights and fog lights. The hood opens up, revealing the cavity where the arms store, which you can pretend is just the engine block, but even cooler than that is that this is where the accessory is stored. That's not a radiator, it's a fairly accurately modeled and placed intercooler for the turbo system. That's so cool! I do say fairly accurate in the sense that if it were 100% accurate, it would be situated just a little bit further back so the air coming in from the hood scoop would pass through it, but hey, the fact they went the extra mile to model the intercooler at all and then place it in more or less the correct spot just scratches the deepest of itches. Another thing I totally love about alternators is that if you look at the figure as a whole, pretty much all the panel lines are constrained to where the lines of the car would actually fall. Fender panels and doors and the like are what the designers have chosen to use for the robot transformation, where they could help it at least. For the part where the robot splits in half, that's obviously unavoidable, but where they can help it, it goes such a long way to really sell that model car motif. Like compare this to something like G2 Sideswipe, and to be clear, this is fine. It's not like it's bad or anything, but on that same token, you can see where there are clear hard lines where the arms are going to come from. Meanwhile, the alternators figure just looks so dang clean using the existing panel lines of the Impreza. I am still just flat out stunned with how incredible this looks. Other details include the molded door handles, the gas cap doors and molded out, the translucent red plastic taillights, chromed exhaust, all the way down to the vanity license plate from the Joyzy. Like, this thing has all the car details dialed up to 11. All of this stuff on a modern day deluxe, I would absolutely go hog wild for, and here it is on an 18 year old toy. Mind you, it's a good thing that this isn't even the half of it, because we've got defroster lines in the rear window, there's rubber tires, and they surround a metallic gold 5 point double spoke OEM rim that are held on by a rivet, which is awesome for rolling, but annoying in the sense that I would love to be able to remove them to get back there and check out those slotted rollers and then check out the calipers and then chrome those rotors and then paint those calipers. But that minor gripe aside, something that's always cool to see on these alternators figures is the articulated steering rack, accomplished on this mold by way of magnets connecting to a single yoke for a limited amount of pivot, but you can easily just unlock the yoke and get a crazy amount of range on either side. So yeah, just an absolutely insane level of detail in the vehicle mode. And we're still not done! Opening up the front door would give us a look at the interior, however opening up both front and back doors gives us an even better look at it all. For inside is a mostly detailed interior. You get your stereo, you get your steering wheel with left and right turn indicators and controls for the windshield wipers, a fully molded dash right down to the breakaway lines where the SRS system is located, and a molded cluster gauge. Like all of this has so much detail packed right into every square inch of the car. There's bucket style racing seats that reclined forward, and finally there's no back seats. Oh, well, that's depressing. Maybe the alternators and present molds have the back seat removed for a weight reduction or something. I'll admit though, it's a little quirky that for one of the very few cars in the series that actually has opening rear doors, there's no molded rear seats. The RX-8 mold in alternators has it, and they look fantastic there. I just sort of wish they were present here on the Impreza as well. Oh well. 
One final detail, we get an opening trunk. Like, talk about unnecessarily awesome. Like, opening hoods are the kind of thing that I geek over when they do it just because of how rare that is. So you can imagine my delight about it being here and how even more rare it is here. And something else I can't get enough of is the scaling on this as well. Like, not only are these cars perfectly proportionate, they're also perfectly in scale with each other as 124 scale vehicles. So here's what they look like with 124 scale 6 foot people. And here's what that all looks like next to Kingdom Rhinox, which also happens to be 124. So that was the car mode. I think it's safe to say this is my favorite series just based on alt mode alone. There's so much love poured into these designs, and I can't get enough of it in the slightest. The Transformers will return after these messages. This episode of Lazy Eyebrows is brought to you by Ridge.com. Ridge.com is the place to go if you're on the market for a wallet with a focus on compact form factor and excellent function. And they come in a variety of different colors too, like this carbon fiber wallet, or this aluminum steel navy blue case. And hey, that's not the only thing they offer these colors in. Check out this key case that also comes in aluminum navy blue. If you're like me at all, and the sound of your keys jingling in your pocket as you walk down the street irritates you with every new step, a new nightmare, as that incessant jingling noise just triggers your sensory processing issues with every single start and turn, then this is a great product for you, as not only does it do that, but it also keeps your wallet and your keys together as a very compact thing right in your wallet for as much space as you can handle. Feeling in the mood for both? Well, good news! They offer a daily driver bundle kit! Combo power! Use the link ridge.com slash lazy eyebrow to get yourself 10% off that daily driver kit. Double combo power! Get yours before Friday, Friday, Friday! September 30th to be entered into their summer sweepstakes for a chance to win $75,000 or a Ford Bronco! Double combo power sweepstakes! So head on over to ridge.com slash lazy eyebrow to pick up your bundle kit today! We now return to the Transformers. So to transform Ricochet, start by opening the hood or removing the intercooler. Open up the front doors and separate the front half from the back half. Pull down the bumpers to make toes, pull out the heels to make a stable base, and then rotate the robot up at the ankles. Fold in the back doors of the frame, then split the legs apart. Rotate the waist around, separate the floorboards from the firewall, and collapse those in together. Fold up the seats, fold in the rocker panels towards the seats, then put them together and peg it into the waist to make the torso section. On the dashboard, move the steering column down. Under the front of the car, pull the arms out and away. Pull the head plate down, and if you arranged your head like mine so that it wasn't visible when the hood was open, pull that down and around. Pull the front of the car down, making sure to open the hood scoop section for head clearance. Take the roof and fold that inwards to make a cleaner robot, or don't, this part is optional. Then this cavity on the front bumper is going to lock into this tab on the waist. Push that together to lock the chest all together. On the shoulders, rotate them around so that the wheel points backwards, rotate the arms to point down, which is easier said than done since the steering knuckle tends to make clearance for this action a little difficult, then unfold the arms and you're done! And here we have robot mode. All things considered, this is not a bad looking robot mode. I mean, there's definitely worse looking ones even within the line, and first impressions alone, this is actually pretty good looking robot. I still love all the vehicle accurate parts making their appearance everywhere, and being the era that it was, this means no faux parts as well, which is always a highlight in my book. It feels weird though that this isn't a jazz retool, or meester as it was released in this line, like I could handle that for the vehicle mode. I mean, it doesn't have to be the same car, and the paint job was right on the mark, but G1 Ricochet was a jazz repaint, and thus got the jazz head. Alternator's Ricochet is a Blue Streak smokescreen repaint, and since they're not about to just rip the head off the Meester mold for one figure, we get to deal with the Blue Streak head for Ricochet. I suppose this isn't the end of the world, though, as without either of the original colors of the Impreza mold in my collection, this just feels like its own character, and I'm kind of alright with that. And beyond all that griping, the colors are on point, so that's actually pretty cool. Except for the red eyes. I'm not sure why that was chosen, but I will admit they do pop pretty hard against the gold. I totally enjoy the fact that the incredibly detailed dashboard is still visible on the back of the car. It's so detailed, and it's so wonderfully sculpted, and it really gives off that whole, this actually turns into a car vibe. It's fantastic. 
I love the way that the chest has been situated as the chest. In general, this is my favorite way to do the whole Transformer robot scheme, but for alternators, it just works so well for both this guy and the RX-8 mold. And something they both do that I 110% love is the way they handle the lower torso. They need this sort of shape for everything below the chest, so instead of a dedicated piece like, say, something like Studio Series 86 Jazz, they get you to build the guts of the robot with floorboards, a frame bit, the receipts that reclined forward to give you the V-shape, all of this is honestly one of the smartest design decisions I've seen for the whole line, and I'm completely enthralled with the fact that it's all made up of actual vehicle parts. This is so expletive and clever. As for the bottom half of the figure, it's nothing to write home about. The legs look pretty decent, with black paint on the thighs to semi-indicate the G1's use of the inverted jazz color thighs, though it's poorly executed and I feel like I would have rather just left white. The rear windows are on the legs in standard Jew and Blue Street form, and I think they actually look really nice here as car parts that make up robot parts. And like the RX-8, the back of the car is used to make up the feet, which again, for the Blue Streak mold, makes perfect sense, and I feel is executed really well when you consider what era of the franchise this was designed in. I mean, the back doors kind of just hang off the back a little haphazardly, and I do wish they were being used as heel support somehow, as this is what we were given to rest the whole figure on, but again, that's kind of just the era this came from. I mean... Look at what was releasing alongside it back then. As for articulation, head is on a ball joint for all sorts of spin, a cutout for a healthy amount of uprange, and some tilt action. The shoulders spin the whole way around. There's outward splay if you can get the steering knuckle to cooperate, not to mention the transformation joint that just loves to collapse inwards. A double jointed elbow, but absolutely no swivel on that bicep. The wrist is on a ball joint for some reason though, allowing for swivel and pivot, which I guess is kinda nice. And the fingers are articulated. It's really the middle ring and pinky as one unit, and the index separate, but of course I forgot to animate it that way. Waist swivels. Fives can go pretty far back and a little bit forward due to a design in the mold that limits how far that piece can move forward, which is tray annoying. And the only a little bit out due to the fact that these are ball jointed hips with no cutout. As such, you are only limited to these ball joints as your thigh swivel. Knees technically are double jointed with a really weird placement, so that's kinda neat. And the toe is articulated as well. All in all, I do find this kinda funny. Like, it still is a good toy, but coming at this with the context of modern-day engineering, it feels incomplete. Nine years ago when I reviewed Jazz, I had no issue with the articulation whatsoever. I was happy with what he came with and thought he was a great toy at the time. That time being, however, when this was what was releasing in Mainline. Both of these figures have missing bits of articulation here and there, like Mirage not having a thigh swivel, or Sunstreaker having it at the knees. And you contrast that with today, with this being what you get, and I don't think words can properly convey just how spoiled we are in mainline nowadays. Figures look super close to how they should, with articulation points that gives the early days of Masterpiece a run for its money, and then we have the audacity to complain about petty things like Grimlock's front teeth? Some days I feel like we really don't grasp how good we have it these days in terms of figure engineering, myself included. Anyway, as for accessories, he does indeed come with the intercooler that just unfolds. I feel like this is funny in concept. Like, does he shoot coolant at people? Where does the coolant go if he doesn't shoot it when it's not being used? Are there valves that close off and store the coolant when it's going to robot mode? All these pointless questions and more, right here on The Lazy Eyebrow. Anyway, this peg plugs into the hand, which then closes, and then you do your best Peter Cullen impression and yell, Intercooler Online. As far as weapons go, it does the job, and I always love it when the weapon is made up of another car part, like the muffler on the RX-8 mold, or the leaf springs of the Ironhide mold. Again, it just scratches that deep model itch for me. As for size comparison, here's Ricochet with Jazz, Rhinox, and the Humans, all of which are 124. For a close but slightly out of scale comparison, here's 120 scale Combiner Wars Groove and the original Masterpiece Megatron to give you an idea of what the Alternators figures looked like with MP01 and other figures from that era. So that was Alternators Ricochet. It has been so long since I've been able to talk about an Alternators figure on this channel, last time of which was briefly five years ago and actually talking about it with Jazz nine years ago. These figures are so wonderfully crafted in their alt mode with details inside and out. I love how those details are carried over to the robot too. It's sad to say the robot is usually mediocre in terms of what it can do, and that's a shame. But for me, the fact that it's a scale-accurate car certainly makes up for it. Which, I'll admit, kinda gives me reason to pause. Why do I excuse the lack of a good robot just because the vehicle's incredible? 
Last month, I openly flogged this thing for doing the exact same thing as a train. Maybe it's because the vehicle is doing so much more for accuracy? Like, this car is a good chunk of empty space while being a completely detailed cabin, and Shoki didn't even come with a scaled cab. Or, I don't know, maybe it's because it gets a little bit of leeway in the sense that this is the kind of stuff that was also releasing in that era, and by comparison, it's practically a masterpiece of its day. Or maybe it's because back in the day this released for 20 bucks, and if you adjust for inflation, that's the price of today's Voyager class figures. And Shoki, meanwhile, retails for the price of a Commander class and a Leader class combined. That's a whole combiner skeleton and three of its limbs, or a Skylinx with an Optimus to ride on top. Therefore, you kind of expect more from Shoki. I don't know what the actual reason is, I just know I love the Alternators line. For all the risks they took to make a toy with a heavy vehicle bias, there were a few gems that came out of it, and this mold was definitely one of them. As such, in concept, I would absolutely love to see this return with today's engineering. To see model-accurate licensed vehicles of our current era releasing today with masterpiece-level articulation would be incredible. Imagine Trax as a Corvette C8, Prowl and Company as the upcoming Fair Lady 450Z, Lambros as the Countach LPI 800, Optimus as a licensed Freightliner Argosy instead of the Dodge Ram they made him for some reason. All those kinds of things. Of course, I say this as I want this in concept, as while these things released for the price of a Voyager class figure back then, we all know full well that these things nowadays would blow well past 100 or more per figure. I hate to sound like I'm way past my prime here, but man, they just don't make them like they used to. This has been the Lazy Eyebrow. <laughs>